uh, to the best that I can. Uh, Mr. Dhalan in his presentation made a very, very important point towards the end, and I think it, it all falls falls in place because the CCI is a young regulator. The CCI has been around for about eight years. Uh, enforcement started back in 2009. Merger control came in force in 2011. So clearly, uh, infant steps, baby steps, now we're seeing them more uh, in the toddler phase, uh, very active uh, uh, and also effective, not just active, but also very, very effective because I think the merger control space is one area where they are, uh, they've done a pretty good job. Uh, enforcement in some of the other areas has um, is, is been a very steep learning curve for the CCI. Uh, they've had to uh, deal with a lot of issues. They've had to deal with a lot of non-issues. Uh, you know, we had some instances where uh, they would pass an order, for instance, in, a, in the real estate sector. And suddenly the world over, people would start thinking that the CCI is the answer to all my real estate troubles and would flood the CCI with complaints. Uh, then we had a whole series of cases against uh, the Chemist and Druggist Association in India. And, you know, pharma is a very, very sensitive and touchy subject here. And during the course of the last eight years, uh, they have gotten involved across sectors, across industries, across uh, subject areas. And some of them have proved to be pretty straightforward. Uh, some of them have proved to be extremely challenging. And, uh, and one of those areas is IP. Uh, intellectual property rights. Uh, the CCI, of course, uh, like every other regulator, is extremely keen to establish uh, its credibility as an effective regulator. They want to be seen as a regulator that is in touch with times, that is uh, maybe a little ahead of its time. Uh, and therefore, uh, they have been drawn into some uh, pretty big cases involving high-tech uh, technology and intellectual property rights. And I just want to quickly touch upon some of those. Now, on the face of it, when you think intellectual property rights, uh, back in law school, uh, of course, we were taught about how there is an element of exclusivity and monopoly that attaches to IPR. And then you have the competition laws and the competition regime which says that your exclusivity can be bad. Perhaps when you have some sort of an exclusivity, you acquire market power. And when you have market power, you can perhaps then abuse that market power. And then, of course, the manner in which you uh, apply that exclusivity. Typically, intellectual property rights are either exploited by the IP owner or licensed out. So you get into a series of licensing agreements. Uh, so there are ways in which the competition law can step in and monitor and, and perhaps curtail the behavior of an IP holder. And so there was some element of doubt uh, initially, and I'm, I'm talking about the time much before the CCI, whether the IP and competition laws uh, are aiming at two very distinct uh, objectives. Ultimately, I think everyone has uh, reconciled to the fact that they both want the same thing. IP laws and competition laws both want innovation, they want consumer benefit, and therefore, uh, you know, the debate about whether they can go hand in hand or work together has been more or less settled. There are critical issues, at least in the Indian context, that have come up in the recent past. Uh, one of them, of course, is does the CCI have the jurisdiction over conduct of intellectual property right owners? Uh, the second is, if they do have jurisdiction, what are the areas in which they can exercise that jurisdiction? Third is, uh, what are the limits? So if there are identified areas in, in, in the context of which the CCI can step in, uh, then there have to be certain limits, and where do you draw those lines? Now, uh, I will not spend too much time on this. Uh, Mr. Tal gave a wonderful presentation on the merger control aspect of the Competition Act. Uh, there are two other critical areas, in fact three other critical areas under the Act. One is of course anti-competitive <coughs> agreements. Uh, this is section 3. Then you have abuse of dominance which is section 4. And finally you have section 49. Not much is often spoken about 49 but that is competition advocacy. And uh, those, for those of you who don't know it, the CCI is actually very very active in that. They, they play a very very active role in competition advocacy and, and that's something uh, in-house lawyers should, should be very mindful of because they do hold a lot of good workshops. They can actually come and take workshops in your organization if you invite them. Uh, and and, and it's, it's, it's a very important aspect of what the CCI does. Uh, this is, of course, the institutional framework. Uh, so you have the CCI uh, with a chairperson and six members. So it's a seven-member body. Uh, one level above is the Competition Appellate Tribunal. Uh, the Act provides for it to be a three-member body with one chairperson and two members. The chairperson's position is currently lying vacant. 
uh, and we're likely to see some major changes because the government plans to sort of merge uh, some of these tribunals uh, into a single body. Uh, finally, the appeals go to the Supreme Court of India. Uh, very important, and this is also perhaps critical from the IPR perspective, you have two very good provisions under the Competition Act, uh, Section 21 and 21A, uh, and these are uh, what we call the reference provisions. Now, under these provisions, for instance, the CCI is today uh, looking at a case which involves perhaps an issue pertaining to telecom, and Mr. Tal mentioned it. They reach out to the telecom regulator. They reach out to the concerned regulatory bodies to take their opinions. They reach out to the departments to take their opinions. And vice versa is also true. So if a department of government or any other statutory body is looking at an issue, is looking at a case which has an element of competition law, they can very well refer the matter back to the CCI and ask for an opinion. Uh, we do see it happening a lot. Uh, it's not written, so you don't find too many orders of publicly available orders of the commission, except perhaps a few in the merger, in the merger control space. But on the behavioral side, not too many orders would actually reflect the fact uh, that the CCI does reach out to uh, experts and the stat relevant statutory authorities, and they do take opinions. Now, I'll just go back to the issues uh, that I identified, the three big questions that I identified. CCI has been given uh, a broad mandate and a broad power, the, the jurisdiction of the civil courts has completely been excluded. And finally, you have a 62, which says that the provisions of the Competition Act are in addition to and not in derogation of any other law for the time being in force. So it's a little surprising because typically you won't have a legislation which has a section 60 and a 62 in the same place. One which gives and the other one which says that it, it, uh, it, the provisions are in addition to and not in derogation of. And that is the area where a lot of jurisdictional conflicts have arisen. Uh, we have subject matter jurisdictional conflicts that are currently uh, being uh, adjudicated before high courts. And these are the provisions which have uh, become more and more relevant. Uh, I will not go through uh, 3, 4, and 5. I already mentioned it. Now, one of the cases uh, where intellectual property rights has come right to the forefront and is at the doorstep of the commission is the Ericsson case. Uh, and I should attach a lot of disclaimers because I represent that company. Uh, it's, a, it's an important case because A, it deals with FRAND issues. It deals with standard essential patents. It deals with licensing practices. Uh, and these are all technical terms. Uh, but simply put, uh, all of us use mobile phones. These mobile phones are basically a powerhouse of several technologies. And all of, most of these technologies that you have on your phones are standards. Uh, which is why you can, you know, your Nokia can communicate with someone else's iPhone. They're all standardized technologies. And the reason they become standards is because a lot of the companies which sit together and spend billions of dollars in research and development, uh, they come together to decide what becomes a standard and what doesn't. And if company A's technology is chosen to become the standard, uh, then they are put under an obligation to license their patents pertaining to that technology on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. Uh, and this whole FRAND dispute, SEP disputes, has taken a sort of a global proportion because the FTC, DOJ have had several opportunities to look at it. The European Commission has had several opportunities. The Chinese authority has been very active. The Koreans came out with an order very, very recently. Uh, so clearly, back in 2013, when the commission was just about five years old, uh, it, was, it was an area to look at. And, and they immediately jumped at the opportunity. So when somebody went and complained to them, saying that you have this big company which owns these uh, standard essential patents and is not uh, licensing those patents on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, you need to look at it for abuse of dominance. The commission did initiate the investigation. Uh, and well, of course, there was a jurisdictional issue that immediately came up because uh, that company had, in fact, sued the complainant uh, in the civil court. Uh, for infringing its patent. And the complainant in the civil court had actually challenged the validity of the patent in the civil court itself. Uh, so it's a big fight which has been going on in the high court. And at the first level, the first single judge of the Delhi high court is ultimately held. Uh, and uh, I'll just quickly read out the excerpts from the judgment. It says, undoubtedly, the Competition Act and the Patents Act are special acts operating in their respective fields. However, viewed in the aforesaid perspective, the Patent Act would be a special act vis-a-vis -vis the Competition Act. And this is, again, an interpretation of statutes issue. Uh, so the Competition Act, the Patent Act, would be a special act vis-a-vis -vis the Competition Act insofar as patents are concerned. Therefore, if there, is a, if there are irreconcilable differences between the Patent Act and the Competition Act, 
in so far as anti-abuse provisions are concerned, the Patent Act being a special act shall prevail notwithstanding the provisions of Section 60 of the Competition Act. Of course, then the judge went on to say that Section 60 is enacted only to restate and emphasize that management practices and conduct which may otherwise be legitimate under general laws, they would nonetheless be subject to the rigors of the Competition Act. And clearly the judge uh, had been looking at this case for over two and a half years, so there was, you know, it was, uh, it was a heavy case even for the judge to, uh, uh, to deal with. And I think he did the best job that he could have, and he finally held that there is no irreconcilable repugnancy between uh, or conflict between the Patent Act and the Competition Act. I mean, in, in one paragraph he said if there is a conflict, the Patent Act would prevail because it is special, but he ultimately ruled that there was no conflict and therefore both the legislations can go hand in hand, the CCI can continue doing what it's doing, whatever cases are going on, infringement proceedings and patent validity proceedings are going on in the civil courts can go hand in hand. And of course this judgment uh, has now been appealed, uh, it's still pending before a division bench of the Delhi High Court. And this will be one of the most, you know, more important cases. There are several jurisdictional cases that are pending in the, in the High Court right now, uh, where the CCI's jurisdiction to entertain IP issues has been challenged. Uh, this would be one of those cases where ultimately uh, the lines would be drawn and, and, and the space would be created for the civil court and the competition agency to perhaps look at cases in parallel. Uh, now, there are, that, is, that was of course from the FRAND and standard essential patent perspective. Uh, the CCI is also currently uh, looking at a case which involves some element of the order in the next couple of months. Uh, section 3, subsection 5. So section 3 is about anti competitive <coughs> agreements. Typical agreements would be in the nature of cartels, uh, you know, horizontal vertical agreements, they're all covered. Interestingly, section 3 has, an, you know, it has a provision which says that the prohibition on anti competitive agreements, the prohibition on entering into agreements which cause an appreciable adverse effect on competition, will not impact the ability of an IPR holder to impose reasonable conditions or reasonable restrictions on the licensee, so to say. Uh, now this has been interpreted in a very, very narrow manner by the Commission. We had a, a very significant case in the automobile sector where uh, there are a whole layer of agreements which the auto companies have with the uh, entities which make spare parts. And those companies are prevented and prohibited from selling directly in the aftermarket and they are told basically that whatever spare parts you manufacture for us will be sold through us, through our network. And this was a case involving all the automobile companies in India, 17 of them, and the CCI came out with a very, very hard hitting order which has been upheld by the Appellate Tribunal. Uh, but they interpreted, both the CCI and the Appellate Tribunal have actually interpreted the IPR provision very, very narrowly. So essentially in India right now, uh, if you're imposing a restriction on a licensee, as long as your IP is granted in India under one of the Indian statutes, uh, you can try and argue this exemption. If you have an IP which is not registered in India under one of the Indian statutes, which are recognized under 3.5, perhaps this exemption will not be available. So it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, it's, it's, it's a very strange place to be caught into when you're talking about MNCs who have technologies that are you know, patented and, and registered in other parts of the world but are under the Make in India sort of initiative are being given, you know, Indian companies are being given access to it. Uh, this could prove to be a little problematic. Uh, this case again is something that is likely to go up to the Supreme Court. It has been appealed to the Supreme Court, so, uh, you know, it, uh, in the, probably in the next couple of years there will be some clarity on this. Uh, now, I'll quickly just walk you through the enforcement trends uh, as far as Section 4 is concerned, which is abuse of dominance. I discussed the Fran issue, which is the Ericsson case. Uh, one other sort of category of cases, we have two cases there. Uh, one is JCB and the other one is the ABB case and this is about uh, vexatious litigation. This is about how IP holders indulge in vexatious litigation to somehow deny market access to people who are using competing technologies or are licensees of their technology. Um, to the CCI, we have probably eight cases that are going on against Monsanto right now and all of it boils down to the issue of an unfair royalty. So Monsanto has various sub-licensees in India where Monsanto's technology is being used to come up with hybrid seeds in the cotton space and all of them have challenged Monsanto's license terms saying that the royalty that is being demanded is unfair and it's, it's exceeding, uh, it's, it's extremely high. And of course there's an element of discrimination there. 
Now, just to give you a quick snapshot of the jurisdictional battle that, that we have had going on in the courts. For instance, before the CCI, uh, in the Ericsson case, one of the issues is what is the correct, correct basis to determine royalty? Uh, what, whether the royalty is reasonable, whether the terms of a non-disclosure agreement that is valid, and whether and under what circumstances a patent holder can initiate proceedings and seek injunctions. Now, before the High Court, you have a question of A, does Ericsson have a validly existing patent? Now, it's extremely important because there has to be a final ruling on that. If somebody is challenging the validity and existence of my patent, but at the same time is going to the commission and pointing a finger at me and alleging that I'm dominant because of my patent, there has to be a ruling somewhere. I can't not have a patent and be dominant, and I can have a patent and not be dominant. So there is a bit of a dichotomy there. Second, because negotiations fail, the parties are before the court, and ultimately the court will determine what the royalty should be and what the reasonable royalty should be. And the same issue is pending before the CCI. The third issue, and I will draw your attention to Section 48 of the Patent Act. A patent is, is basically, I mean, it's, it's just a right to exclude. And Section 48 of the Indian Patent Act recognizes the right to exclude. So if I'm a patent holder, I can exclude the rest of the world from using my patent. And Section 48 is what allows an IP holder or a patent holder in India to go and seek an injunction in court. The very act of seeking an injunction in court is being challenged before the CCI as being an abuse of dominance. So there are overlapping issues. Uh, similarly, in, in JCB and ABB, uh, you have uh, very similar issues. One set uh, being argued before the civil courts and the other being alleged before the CCI. Now, this is where the problem arises. Number one, given that there are similar or near identical issues being agitated before the CCI and the civil courts, is there a real threat or possibility of conflicting outcomes? And if there is a possibility of a conflicting outcome, should one of the two bodies step back? Should the High Court step back or should the CCI step back and wait for an outcome? Now, clearly the CCI has given the mandate, it has a very, very broad mandate. And, and, and you know, one of the mandate is to check on abuse of dominance. And if dominance is linked to the market power that comes with owning an intellectual property right, clearly nobody can argue that the CCI does not have dominance, uh, does not have jurisdiction. But should the CCI hold its hands? Should the CCI give due respect to the principles of committee and recognize the fact that there are courts which are looking at these issues, let the dust settle, and then we will pick up what's left and look at it from a Competition Act perspective and come up with a ruling? Or should the CCI nevertheless just continue down the path that it's going, irrespective of the outcome in the civil courts? <clears throat> so this brings me down to the third question which I raised initially, which is, are there any limits? Uh, clearly at this stage we're not seeing those limits because uh, there is no judicial clarity. Uh, and typical as it is in India, uh, I would imagine it will take at least a good three to five years before there is some clarity and settlement on jurisdictional issues uh, between the CCI and the IP, uh, IP bodies, the authorities under the IP Act. Now, if you look at this particular chart, you have issues that can be determined by the authorities under the Intellectual Property Right Act. So num number one, determination of the validity of whether you have a valid intellectual commission of India can look at all conduct which is unrelated to A, B, and C. So if there's any conduct which is unrelated to validity of the IP, determination of the royalty rate, or infringement of the IP, clearly they have the jurisdiction. But what about conduct which falls squarely within A, B, and C? If there's any conduct of an IP holder which has been challenged before the CCI as being abuse of dominance, and all those are, are issues which can be decided and determined by the authorities under the IP Act, where does the line get drawn? Now, and finally, I mean, that was of course under section 3 and 4. On section 5, uh, uh, Mr. during Mr. Tal's presentation, there was the whole aspect of calculation of turnover and you know, for the purpose of determining whether or not uh, a transaction is notifiable as a combination before the CCI. Uh, under, com under that particular provision as well, the value of the intellectual property is included uh, when you're calculating the value of assets. And uh, Mr. Tal also briefly mentioned about transfer of IP rights and, and, and restrictions so you have uh, the Piramal uh, Enterprises cases, the, the Pfizer cases, where transfer of intellectual property rights was also included within the scope of, of Section 5, and these were transactions which were notifiable. Uh, mere licensing of intellectual property perhaps will not require notification, but 
you know, we are still waiting for some guidance on uh, from the CCI on this. Uh, so I'll just go back to my first point, which is as an eight-year-old organization grappling with a lot of new areas of law and a lot of new areas of conflict, uh, the high-tech sector, uh, you have disrupting disruptive technologies, Uber, Ola have all been dragged before the CCI. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a sort of a watch this space kind of, uh, you know, authority at least for the next three to five years because they will ultimately have to settle the law on how much of the jurisdiction extends into the high-tech space, into the intellectual property space. And I think till then, uh, a lot of the lawyers in India are going to be pretty, uh, pretty busy. Uh, 